we're interested now in uh, in lower cost uh, methods of measuring or at least estimating uh, dust concentrations uh, that are coming off these large area sources. And in particular, I think, Greg, this will be uh, once this method matures, and we're pretty close to that point, uh, this will be a method that can be used on a downwind frontage of arbitrary length. What do I mean by that? I mean, if this, uh, if this screen is the area source and downwind is that way, we'd like to be able to measure the average concentration from the upper right-hand corner to the upper left-hand corner, no matter how big, how long that boundary is. We'd like to know the path average concentration from end to end. Um, at the moment, uh, the methods available to us are either very, very expensive or they're very expensive. Well, and what I mean by that is uh, to do it directly uh, with something like a transmissometer. Uh, a, you need a path length that's 800 meters or more. Not all feed yards um, fit that description. And you'll also need $25,000 to buy the transmissometer and then have somebody that knows how to run a transmissometer to operate the darn thing. Uh, open path lasers are also another possibility, slightly shorter path length, but again, we're talking about 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars for that kind of thing. Uh, another option is to put an array of point monitors uh, all along that downwind boundary and, and then uh, uh, hope interpolate and draw some smooth curve through all those measured concentrations. Well, if you do that with TOMs, uh, you, again, you're laying out 25 thousand each. Uh, and if you don't use TOMs, if you use something else, that, uh, like, just like an FRM sampler, not only are you g getting point measurements, but you're also not getting the, the benefit of the time variation that you get with the TOM. So th what, this allow what, what we're thinking about here is developing a method that is lower cost than all of those, that gives you an opportunity to measure the path average concentration downwind of an area source like this, uh, and to, um, to do that over path lengths that are arbitrary. That is, uh, you don't necessarily need a minimum 800 meters to pull this off. And in fact, that's, uh, we did not use uh, 800 meters to do it. So that's the background on this. Um, it should go without saying that high feed yard dust concentrations impair visibility. Um, pretty clear. So let me, so to speak, let me move ahead uh, uh, and acknowledge uh, the, that the idea uh, for the way we approached this problem uh, was derived from a transportation engineer at the University of Minnesota Duluth. So the USDA NRI project was uh, kind enough uh, to offer some funding to me and a uh, and my collaborator, Dr. Kwan, at in Duluth. Uh, there are not a lot of feedlots in Duluth, but. Um, uh, he had developed a method uh, that was based on early warning systems for fog. Uh, and he had developed the use of both passive and active targets associ uh, in association with digital imagery uh, to infer the density of the fog um, in some critical areas on the highways in, in Minnesota. Aha! Uh, why couldn't we do the same for feed yard dust, which is, after all, at a given location, a reasonably homogeneous stuff. Uh, it's not as though the dust coming off a feed yard is, is always changing. In general, it's pretty much constant uh, material in the same way that fogs are. So we decided to adopt that approach and then refine it somewhat for our purposes. Our first shot out of the, uh, out of the box was to take a bunch of pieces of plywood, paint them black, put a white box in the middle of them so we could get good contrast, uh, and then uh, build them at, size, at, the, at the appropriate sizes so that no matter, how, uh, no matter which one you were looking at through the image, the number of pixels occupied by that target was the same. So this is 100, uh, no, this is 50 meters, 100 meters, and 300 meters, as I recall, something like that. And yet, on the image, they all occupy the same number of pixels, which allows us to do some interesting statistics uh, without having to futz with sample size. Uh, black paint, white paint, contrast, yes, but not really all that good. Um, but in any case, we deployed these uh, on the upwind and the downwind side of feed yard A. <coughs> um, this is the upwind side here. We had the 
uh, the path here to get the, uh, what, what you might term the intrinsic contrast. In clear air, what do you see? How much, is, how much is the contrast between black and white in an image taken in clear air? And then we can use that as the basis for comparing the contrast that we actually measured in the image downwind in the dust plume. The difference between this and this, then, ought to filter out any differences associated with sun angle or the temperature of the color of the sun. Um, so upwind, downwind, same way we do a lot of air quality work, upwind and downwind to filter out some of the confounding influences. Now, again, these were the early um, uh, proof of concept studies under what we might consider a low dust. Uh, you can see that the contrast, uh, these are measured in the 0 to 255 scale that you're probably uh, familiar with on grayscale. If you take uh, black would be 0 and uh, white would be 255. Well, the difference between the black and the white then is what you're seeing here on the vertical axis. And uh, as you can see, our, the, the native or in, intrinsic contrast of our uh, targets was about 180. And under low dust conditions, there wasn't much difference at all between the upwind and downwind, although it, there was some dust present, apparently. You can see a slight decrease in contrast on the downwind side, which is the pink as compared to the blue. Under moderate dust conditions, uh, these are just observations of the scientists and the technicians, uh, we had a, a, a moderate difference, always trending the right direction. Really all this is saying is, duh, it works, right? Uh, the, the concept is, is um, reliable, but now let's see if it's, it can be made more precise. So we refined it, the method further by developing a, a set of high reflectivity targets made out of the same aluminum and glazing that you see on, on highway signage. Uh, so it's high reflectivity. And we designed a, a target with enough edge that MATLAB would have no trouble picking out where the targets are in an image that might include a bunch of uh, background images like trees and trucks and, uh, and uh, lighting, etc. So we have a lot of edge here, a lot of edge between black and white. Uh, to make it easy to uh, to pick out the blobs on the digital image, and we made uh, we had six of these fabricated for the upwind, six downwind, and again sized in such a way that they occupy the same number of pixels on the resulting um, uh, resulting pictures, resulting images. One last little uh, uh, implementation idea: glare was a problem with those high reflectivity targets. So uh, the guys in the shop just built what, what we might just call five-degree wooden shims and inserted them between the target and the steel mount so that the targets were tilted slightly down. And in the evening, with the sun behind us, glare went away in terms of our images. So uh, it's possible to do this on the cheap. Uh, we're using commercial, not commercial grade, consumer grade cameras. These were just Nikon D80s. You used to be a thousand bucks. Now they're down in the five hundred dollar range, um, and I won't go into a lot more detail about that. It's possible to modify those so that you uh, you can make them wide spectrum cameras instead of just the consumer product that we're used to having. Uh, don't worry about that either. It turns out it doesn't make any difference, and in fact, it makes things worse. Uh, so unmodified stock camera off the shelf. Uh, high resolution, the more pixels, the more information you'll get. So these were, I think, 10 megapixel cameras. Down here you can see uh, from west to east, here's the camera. And at various places we, we put T-ohms to measure actual mass concentrations of dust several places along the path. <coughs> and then we uh, computed a path average. That's the only reference point we had, was measuring using point monitors uh, that were measuring continuously over time. And then interspersed with those TIOMs, we had these sets of targets laid out there. And as you can see, they all occupy just about the same number of pixels in the image. Uh, so this is after it's been converted to grid scale, obviously. Uh, here's the thing we like to write home about. Uh, <clears throat> I've just log transformed the average contrast at 400 meters, uh, and that with the path average PM10 concentration, taking the TOM data and interpolating between them and then run it, doing a path average between camera 
and, uh, and uh, the 400 meter target. And as you can see, uh, we get reasonable uh, linearity to the thing. Of course, there's a lot more spread out here um, where the concentration is uh, quite a bit less spread down here. Uh, we're probably violating a few uh, regression assumptions, but we're not concerned about that. Our concern is, does it work? Can you predict it? Not can we satisfy some statistician, pointy-headed person, you know, that sits around in front of a computer all day. This appears to us to work. So um, uh, the, the next uh, steps then are to automate it. We're doing all this processing in, in MATLAB. Let me show you what that, uh, what that looks here. By the way, you don't need to polarize. Don't need to put a filter on there. That's the wide spectrum question. Let's skip over that for now. Uh, the wide spectrum camera actually did worse. Um, dust on the targets. Dust accumulates on the targets, and as you can see, on, especially on the back, does it make any difference to clean it? No, it doesn't matter. Uh, the method is fairly robust to the dust that settles on there. Now, would I just let it go year round? No. Uh, I'd go out there once a month and, and wipe them off. Take me five minutes to get it done. But uh, it should not impair the measurement technique itself over the short term. Uh, let me skip over that as well. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's possible that if we could do it, that we could tease some information out of the red, green, and blue channels of the image. Right now, we've just been working with grayscale. I can't report anything to you about that except to say my guess is that because the feed yard dust has a specific color. Uh, we'll be able to tease that information out. Um, things happen at nighttime. Uh, you have to set your targets in the right place and don't put them right in front of a nightlight. It's going to distort things. This is a picture of the workflow, and I'm done. Um, this is the raw image in RGB. The thing we do is convert it to binary, so it's e each pixel is either black or white. MATLAB does that, and then it looks for rectangle. It finds all of those and creates a mask. Um, and then we take this mask and apply it to this image after this image has been converted to grayscale. So it's actually kind of a four-step procedure. And what we end up with is MATLAB giving us uh, and numbering all targets using this mask on that image converted to grayscale. And it just simply takes an average capacity uh, in each of those rectangles compares them, and spits out the contrast as a, a number between 0 and 255. I'm done. I'm sorry. I think I took too long. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, f for research purposes, uh, we have a stake in the ground where we all always put the camera on its tripod, but we take it inside. Um, you know, between tests. Now, um, in the implementation phase, obviously, you'd, you just want to leave a camera out there. So what we would probably do is put it in a shelter uh, with really good quality optical glass uh, and then maintain that glass really, really well or uh, provide a way of sliding fresh glass in there over time. We haven't worked out all the details of that. At the moment, we're trying to trick MATLAB into doing what we want and then spitting out numbers that we like. But go ahead, Catherine. We're building a bl we're building a black box, and the whole idea of designing our targets the way we did was to make sure that, to the extent possible, we have cre created a unique geometry that MATLAB can pick out from all the other noise in the background. So uh, those uh, can those uh, targets are locked in place. Um, at the location at the moment, and uh, we always set the camera at the same place, uh, plus or minus a couple of inches. But the algorithm in MATLAB is smart enough to process it no matter what. Now, we're not going to ask feed yard owners to buy MATLAB. Hopefully, what we'll do is create a robust app that can, we can then just run the app from your smartphone and off you go. I don't think that's out of the question at all. Other questions? Yes. Uh, we're at the moment we're taking them every five minutes for the purposes of this research. 
Uh, we're taking them every five minutes. You could take them at uh, any arbitrary frequency that you want, but no, they are not time-lapsed. Uh, there is a very specific <coughs> exposure that we need to ensure that we have the image quality that we need. Uh, Sharon is much better at laying all of the technical aspects of the camera settings than I would be, so I won't presume to, but look for that in our, in our paper as we publish it. Um, thanks very much for your attention.